he's so so vain. He's he's so so vain. Aloha and welcome to another He's So Vainy. I am Jeremy Vainy. And I have family in town, so that's why this one is late. I probably won't have one next week. I am unshaven. I am in a messy room that I may try to blur out, or I may not. I don't know. Clearly, I'm a lazy slob. And tired. Ting! (sighs) Okay, so this week's show is... uh, Somebody had asked me to look at this man named Andrew Harvey... Um, and, um, see what I thought. Sent me a link to one video and then I sort of was skimming through it, trying to figure out what it is I'm looking for. And then he sent me a link to another longer video and I'm like, I'm not doing that. (laughs) I'm sticking with it. So sorry. I'm, I'm sticking with the first video. Um, there's only so much one man can handle. Um, so we're going to be looking at, uh, the video is called Holy Lament with, uh, Marab... Mirabai, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Star in Andrew Harvey. Um, Mirabai Star is his friend. They are talking about Holy Lament, which I guess is some sort of grief counseling or group therapy sort of uh, retreat that she is putting together. Um, and overall, I don't have a, a, any problem with that. I have nothing to say about it. Um, I've really, looking at his channel, it was hard for me to see what it was that I was supposed to be reviewing. Because, I mean, essentially he looks like, you know, this Martin Short character who kind of reads roomy poetry and, you know, discovers ye old female mystics behind the male mystics that you may know. You know, that's all fine. Like, what's, but does he have a point of view of his own? I, I don't know. Um, maybe it's in the second video that he sent to me that I'm not going to review here. Um, but so all of this is to say that just be aware that a lot of times when I do these he's so vanies, um, I probably wouldn't endorse bothering with anyone's work um, based on what I'm seeing off the like one video that I'm looking at. But in looking at his stuff, I mean, you know, I may have some criticisms here, but that doesn't mean it's all worthless or don't go to his, you know, YouTube channel, definitely do check him out. I, you know, I think the roomy stuff is interesting and and the other stuff about the mystics, um, is interesting. So he's definitely got stuff to look at. Um, and again, there's no problem with like grief counseling or any of that. So, um, that's that. Uh, and of course I'll have a link, uh, to his work in the description or to this video, and then you can, you know, go to his channel. Um, but I did find something that I, eh, set the spider, spider senses tingling. So he's talking to his friend here and she's talking about, um, I think the myths, whereas she's calling them the myths of grief, which up to this point I have no problem with. But then he chimes in with this and I will tell you what I find problematic. I just wanted to say, I remember once after I'd lost one of my cats, and you know how much I love my cats, one of my friends sweetly said, well, you know, get another one. Yes. Yeah, as if you could replace someone who had been your deepest soul companion. It was it was really, it was funny. I, at least I laughed. But Good. it's that Good. attitude that is so fatal. But there's something very dark in that attitude, too. Mm. And I think it's worth exploring why people yes, in our people... culture are forbidden grief. Right. Because once you allow yourself to grieve, you realize just how much is going so dreadfully and painfully and terrifyingly wrong in our world. And that opens you up to a clarity about cruelty and injustice, which the powers that be don't want you to have, because they know that as long as they keep you divorced from your grief, they also keep you divorced from your passion and from your righteous anger and from your intense will to see things transformed. So that that refusal of permission isn't just a, a cultural thing. It has a deep, dark purpose behind it, which we have to analyze. Does that make sense to you? I agree with you completely. Okay, I don't. 
Um, who are these powers that be? Is there a memo from the CIA <laughs> going around saying, do not let people grieve? I mean, I get what he's saying, and it seems to make sense um, because certainly it serves the powers that be, the political powers. I'm assuming he's talking about not some like alien cabal, but like the, the normal powers that be um, for us to keep distracted, keep diverting our attention and so on and so forth. And I used to think that, you know, at some point, my little conspiratorial mind, and certainly there may be conspiratorial things, certainly in the corporate world and in, in advertising and so forth to keep you you know, engaged in the capitalist system and engaged in not caring about what um, the power structures do in the world to other people. As long as we get what we want, we're okay with that. Yeah, sure, they foster that. But guess what? Those powers that be are human beings. Uh, and we're human beings. And we're all in this together. So we all, sh like, in other words, we're not just being, no one's brainwashing us. They're giving us what we want. And so if what we want, by and large, as the masses, um, is to be placated, is to be diverted, is to be drugged up and not dealing with our true feelings, not having to care about anyone else in the world, is catering to our, our I me, mine selfishness, that's because that's what we want. Like, that's how they can get away with it, is because we want it. And that's the part that we really don't want to look at. No one wants to look in the mirror. You always want to put it out there on the powers that be. The powers that be need to look in their own mirror, of course, but so do we. Um, and, you know, uh, I certainly got a, a good firsthand taste of this doing, um, recently I did this Tom Cheatham seminar series where he was looking into my book Urgency and like, Almost everyone, maybe there was one person. Did I talk about this in the last video? I'm not sure if I did, but sorry if I did, I'll talk about it again. Because it really is like just shocking how um, maybe one person, and to an extent Tom, um, were willing to say that like, yeah, we're, we're doing our best to destroy the earth here. And we're at a real, we're beyond, you know, we're beyond <laughs> help at this point. Um... There were, and these are like presumably somewhat liberal or at least socially liberal, um, older, uh, scholarly type people who, a couple of whom are into the plant medicines, man. And none of them even thought global warming was a problem. In fact, they said. Somebody said, and they kind of all agreed, I guess, um, that I was, one, overblowing, the, you know, overstating the situation, uh, and that, two, it's an American um, problem, like the lie of it. In other words, the only people in the world who really seem to think global warming is a problem is Americans. Nobody else seems to care, and one guy said the younger generation doesn't even care this much about it, that they, they think that there's not. And it's like, it's all backwards to me because America is actually like the last country on earth to care. And the young people are the ones who are screaming, hey, you guys are screwing us over in our future. So this is how backwards it is, even among like well-educated, presumably liberal-ish, or at least open-minded, they fancy themselves people, is to say there's no problem here. And, you know, um, if that's where we are, <laughs> there's a big problem here. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, now, I'm sure they would be just fine to go on and, and complain about corporate greed and the powers that be and, you know, all of this stuff in terms of serving their own... Uh, in quote unquote enlightenment, not really enlightenment, but their own, you know, journey into understanding and knowledge. Like that seems to be what the powers that be never want us to, to get to is like the hero's journey, right? Or the, the, the archetypal journeying, uh, the journey of the genius, as Michael Mead might point out, um, as a necessary journey. Like these are the things that they might keep us from. Um, you know, with hidden knowledge and diverting our attention and all that and secrecy. 
Um, that just is not, you know, that thinking that way is a diversion. It just is. Like, if we can't look at ourselves and what we're doing in the world and how we're doing it and why, which is, again, basic selfishness, just like we want what we want when we want it. Yes, we were raised in a culture to do that. But as adults, um, can't we see that? Can't we see through the culture? Do we have to stick with the culture? And, and what he seems to be saying here, Andrew Harvey, is it's not just that culture. There really is like a cabal of powers that be that keep us from grief. That just doesn't, that doesn't make sense. We keep us from grief. I see it every day. Hell, I see it with the person staying with me. You know, we, we get so doped up on um, the drugs that our psychiatrists give us that we don't even remember um, what the original issue was in the, and don't care, frankly, because we feel better with the side effect of like being in a different state of mind, being a bit loopy, being a bit tired, being a bit almost concussive, <laughs> right? Like, but it's okay because everyone else will pick up after you, right? Like if you can go through life being Mr. Magoo and not giving a shit, then, oh, well, good enough. I'm a good person. Um, and I guess the real problem is Trump. The real problem is corporate greed. The real problem is the political structure, you know. Um, it, it's all the problem. All of it is the problem. And it's all symptomatic of what? The mind. The mind that we have brought or that we are using, all of us. Um, the especially the westernized mind that is not interconnecting that is you know sees I me mine and therefore you and you are a potential enemy and you want my property and you want my stuff and I've got a guard against you you know all of that thinking I mean here's a revelation we don't have to even think that way uh, it just doesn't even like it's an unhealthy wrong way to be and then some people acknowledge that and then so they try to run into the the other thing and do cultural appropriation or try to like weasel their way into like uh you know nature cultures first people's cultures and that sort of thing um and it just that that's not the answer either it it's like all of this running f from ourselves instead of just sitting and having clarity and in that moment of clarity, once everything's cleared up, who are you? Who are you when you're not fog? <laughs> right? So that's where we are. Anyway, let me see if there's anything else I want to comment on with this. Because what it does is it takes the, it, it strips away the, the impediments to clear seeing. It's almost like, yes. it's, it's almost like the opposite, I think, of what way people think of grief as being this dark cloud that descends on you and you can't experience life as it is it's it almost feels in my experience like the opposite grief is a fire that strips away the veils and then we can see clearly and people who see clearly are dangerous in yes this, in yes and what you're doing really in this wonderful retreat is is empowering people to become dangerous Yes. Because if the, we claim the power of our grief, if we claim the clear eyes of our grief, if we claim the passion of our grief, if we unleash the truth that our grief connects us to, then we become rebels of love. Mm, precisely. There's such a thing as rebels of love. See, again, this is the language of, of me in the world doing something to better myself and even in this altruistic way because lord knows he's doing his best to come from the heart here and so is she but this is just the mind that we are not even caught in it's what we are um which says okay i see this problem and so now it's like well let's let's treat grief as though it's actually an enlightening clarifying thing and in some sense, it can be, but it can't be the ultimate clarifier. It's not going to bring you to the ultimate clarity. Um, and furthermore, the ultimate clarity has nothing to do with you. Like, the ultimate clarity is the I am that, right? So I am love, which means I'm never going to feel grief. Grief can't touch love. So there is no, okay, now I see a truth. 
I have clarity, and in that clarity, I am going to choose to be a, a rebel for love. Like, that's not a thing. It's how we do things here, and we say that that's better than, like, not caring, right? Which is true. It's better than clubbing each other. It's better than not giving a shit, <laughs> being unloving in, in that mediocre way. Uh, but... Are we done with this yet? Of this better than, worse than? Are we done swinging on the hierarchy? Are we done, like, because you may get bored being a rebel of love and, you know, it may get exhausting after a while fighting yourself to be a rebel of love and you can just go right back into complacency or worse. Are we done with the mind that has the ability to do that, to completely fail itself at every turn or to fail the world at every turn? Um... They're not, and that's not a criticism of them. That's all of us, right? Like, until you have the moment of um, self-annihilation that you can't even do, there is no how. I've been telling you this, and you've heard this, I'm sure, from other people, but there is no how. So the moment of just the body that is projecting you, for you are a thought construct, whether you like to hear that or not, it's what you are. And when the body gets that this thought construct seeking to be love or seeking all this stuff um, can't actually get there, is doing the wrong thing, is being utilized in the wrong way. It's the wrong tool for the job. In fact, there is no tool for the job. When the body gets that, the body shuts you off, stops projecting you. You are gone and there is nothingness. And that nothingness is consciousness per se. That nothingness is this love we're talking about, is truth being and in that moment it's being you <laughs> the self like you could say like we're always that like technically we are all manifestations of one consciousness but the self-awareness of that consciousness the point of view of that consciousness the wholeness of that consciousness um is not something that you are likely to ever experience in your life um until you until the death of self happens i mean it's you will not. So what I'm saying is um, there are people who sort of say like, well, but we're already all love. Like he may know that. She may know that. But that's not enough. We need to be the first person self-identity as. Not, you know, Jeremy pretending to be or proclaiming it because I know that we're all one consciousness. That person proclaiming it and feeling good about it and feeling emotional and being a good person is still the blockage to the fact, to the truth. And so when that blockage is lifted, when the body understands exactly what I just said so completely, that it's not just a logical thing, but it's a full body, I give up, release, it's choiceless surrender. It's choiceless surrender, choiceless because the body sees it so clearly that there is no choice. It just, it's reflexive right action. And in that moment, uh, truth, love, whatever word you want to use here, wholeness, becomes the case. The first person identity as that becomes Jeremy, becomes whoever you are out there watching this, becomes that through the body. And another way of putting this is that if the body is in time, if the body is of time, the timeless gets to come through time. The first person identity of timeless awareness comes through time. Um, we are already of that timeless awareness, you know, like time is an illusion, blah, blah. We are already of that substantively, but the, but the perspective of that is not our perspective and it is when the self is not. Does that make sense? Good. Then tell your buddy to shut you up. Did I say buddy? I meant body. Maybe your buddies with your body. I don't judge. Okay, so I was going to keep going with this and, you know, look and see if there's anything else to talk about, but I feel like it's probably all going to come back to this one issue, and I feel like I uh, I nailed it. So <laughs> uh, let's just sit with this, and um, that'll be it. But I do want to um, answer a part of uh, someone, uh, JS7177, on last week's episode, Toddler Eckhart Tolle says the cutest things. He he did write uh, to that. I guess he had, he had um, 
written to another show thread, and, and then I answered it. And so this is his talking about this sh- episode, but also hearkening back to what I was saying to him. So I'm going to pick it up here uh, in the middle of his comment. Here he's talking about, uh, yeah, I guess he had asked or said something about, I wish there was some way to objectively corroborate uh, or scientifically or something, you know, these people's ex- are experiences of these enlightenment things, because if there's no objective way to corroborate it, then how can we know? And if you watched the episode last week, you, you saw my answer to that. So he says here now, when I talk about having some kind of objective corroboration, it's that if we have some sort of repeatable process that gives similar insights, something anyone can do and have the same experience. Or is this all a type of self-inflicted brainwashing to want to become a more spiritually enlightened individual? And yes, to both. Like, I think, um, as Ken Wilber would point out, with his having mapped out the inner cosmos, um, you can have, you can do certain, let's Zen meditations. Let's just take that as an example. You can do these things and they will bring you to certain places. You could um, understand a Zen cone and it wakes you up to something. And that thing that it wakes you up to is um, going to be uniform. So it's going to be the same or similar for to you as someone else as someone else. Um, I interviewed, who is it, Greg Kaminsky, um, who uh, hosts the Occult of Personality podcast. I interviewed him for Dreamland. He wrote a book about Buddhism, like an intro guide to Buddhism maybe even, I don't remember the title of it, but it was specifically to his sect that he has just sort of in the last few years had been um, studying. Um, He has like a guru kind of guy or whatever. And what he describes doing as a Buddhist is basically repeating stuff in his head over and over and over again until he has like a vision, right? And, And it works. Like after you think something a million times, suddenly you project it into the room, right? So... I mean, it's, to my mind, a hallucination or a a trick. And I think it's a repeatable trick. So, yeah, that is a repeatable process. And it may be interesting because um, it, it may promote feelings in you and it may be interactive even, not just like you see a vision, but there's a meaning there and all of that. But what I would say to that is that this... Um, the brainwashing part of that to me, or, you know, that's kind of harsh, but um, I would say the self-inflicted wound is that when you're seeking spiritual enlightenment and you're coming upon these types of paths, um, they're all keeping you within the universe. They're keeping you within the human mind. They're keeping you within knowledge. And if we're seeking the timeless, if we're seeking that which um, cannot be known, cannot be stored in knowledge, um, which is only alive when it's not knowledge. knowledge. Knowing it is the death of it. Speaking it is the death of it. Being it is the thing. Because you have to care enough to be a seeker in the first place, it's easy to get then caught in traps of having found something, right? And the universe is all too willing to give you things to find, Um, because you are the universe and the universe is you. So the universe wants you here. It's the same as saying you want to be here, even though you want to know the truth, even though you want me, you want the ultimate, you want wholeness. But of course, everything about us tells us that we're going to find that here. We're going to go inward. We're going to journey into, you know, archetypal realms or religious realms, or we're going to do psilocybin, or we're going to do ayahuasca, and we're going to have these experiences with gods and goddesses and whatever it is. And that that's more real than real. It, it, it's sort of got this hyper reality to it. But is it? <laughs> it? Or is it just formless? And so it seems more real because we're told that this form, this density and matter are unenlightened or a lower level on a hierarchy. And so... People even put more stock in dreams than they do reality a lot of times because that's formless. And so that's got this air of mystery about it. And all of these types of things are the traps that we set up to remain ourselves despite knowing that for real truth with a capital T to be the case requires, as I've been saying, uh, for one to be timelessness. 
not just take something that was once timelessness that somebody described who had that experience or described as, you know, maybe somebody who is alive timelessly, like Buddha, let's say, uh, describes truth, describes those experiences, gives it to you and says, look, this is what it is. It is for him because he is that. But you're in time. You're a psychological construct and you're interpreting that and you're taking that and then you're building upon it. And then future generations are going to look at that and go, oh, look at these ancient people. Didn't they know something? And then you're all trapped in the same thing, which are thought constructs, which may have come from a depth that is beyond the human mind, but now it is of the human mind. It's as if Medusa has, I've used this in the book Urgency, so I apologize, readers of that, for being redundant, but it is as if, like, you know, looking uh, at Medusa turns you to stone. It's like looking at truth, looking at timelessness as a being in time turns truth, turns timelessness into stone. And ironically maybe uh since we're psychological beings who take from the past modify it in the present to create the future that's what we've already done with these stones so these ancient stones are already set up for us in the future we're just taking from the past the things that we've heard and we want them <laughs> and we're modifying ourselves as we climb these stones that feel as though they're more real than real because they're representations of truth but there's still you doing the climbing. Those are still what has been said or thought or remembered or understood about truth that isn't you living it. And you living is you climbing those, going through the motions of a Zen whatever. And so, yeah, going through the motions of a Zen whatever, you may see this stone here or that stone there, and then you think you're making your way to truth. You're getting there, you're getting there. But you can't get there because that's all dead. Sorry? He's, He's so, so very.